California Institute of the Arts, which is the famous Disney School. They, um, he learned uh, his skills there and then went on to work in um, the movie industry, which many people have as a dream <laughs> uh -huh. when you're younger. And he was lucky enough to work for many large companies like Industrial Light and Magic, um, DreamWorks, um, Disney Buena Vista, and um, he's worked on some of the really important films um, that we all know. Tron is one of the ones he did a lot of work on but he was actually um, here when they did Phantom Menace. And um, he's gonna, he's just retired to Door County and we're fortunate to have him here to share his memories and experiences with us. Great. <laughs> well, thanks for being here today. Um, Let me know when I should turn the lights off. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, any questions that you have about Memory, my memories and experience. I'll, I'll probably uh, talk about those a bit later, but what I have is a 30 minute uh, video presentation to watch. And if you have questions during the presentation, please, you know, just let me know because there, we're gonna cover a lot of stuff. And uh, <clears throat> this, this uh, goes pretty, some of the images go by very quickly. Uh, and uh, I will stop at certain times and talk about what some of the terms mean uh, because there are terms that are specific to the industry. Um, so what I'm doing is we are covering, we're going to look, I, I want you to, I, this is really designed to give you an overview of what visual effects are and how they work and, uh, and how, how um, well, how, how people in visual effects actually uh, approach things and do problem solving and stuff like that. And so we start from a historic, it's really a history of visual effects from the beginning to basically where we are now. And I'll be talking about some of the most, some of the films that I figure are the most important. Now these may not be your favorite films. They're not necessarily my favorite films. Uh, and, uh, but, and, and you may think that I, I may not uh, cover some of the visual effects films that you think I should cover. But, uh, you know, if you have ideas about that, please let me know at the end. So one of the first things I want to talk about is the diff you, you've heard the term special effects and visual effects. There's, there is a lot of people use the term special effects uh, actually incorrectly. <laughs> special effects are when people shoot production, when they're on the set, they, they do a uh, something physically on the set. So let's say you need wind. Uh, you're outdoors and you need wind, or maybe you're you're shooting something indoors and you want to make it look like it's outdoors. And so you have somebody who's an, a special effects person who will uh, they'll bring in a wind machine. Uh, another type of special effects person does pyrotechnics. So if you want to blow something up, um, that's what a pyrotechnician does. If you uh, there are, if you want to break something apart on a set, that, that is special effects. If you have fire, actual fire on a set, that is, um, that is special effects. So those are all the things that you would do during actual filming the live action. Visual effects is different. Visual effects is what you do after the live action is filmed. You, you affect the film in some way, or you affect the image in some way. And that's what we call a post-production uh, process. Now, when we say post-production, uh, editing is post-production, when you cut the film and you select everything and you put it in order. Uh, along with the editing process, the visual effects process takes place during the editing process. Uh, there's other, but there's also audio. People do special audio effects as well. Uh, and there's also, just to give you a little bit of an overview, there's also pre-production. Before you ever go out and shoot anything, you, uh, the director will select a team, uh, a director of photography, there will be a, a, an art director, actually a production designer, and uh, they'll <clears throat> and there'll generally be a storyboard person, and, and they'll create storyboards so that all the images, that, all the shots that, they're, that they uh, plan to shoot Will be uh, uh, stored, will be uh, visualized in storyboard form. Storyboards are just drawings, basically. So, uh, and visual effects, because so many films today that are in theaters 
our visual effects films, uh, lots of pre-production is involved and, and there's actually new types of pre-production. I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. So um, uh, I think that's everything. So I'll, I'll go through this. If there's questions during, please let me know. And uh, then again, we'll have a question, a more open question and answer at the end. And if anybody wants to hang out, uh, you know, if anybody wants to talk with me after all this, I'll hang out and be happy to talk to anyone who wants to talk. So hopefully you guys on the side will be able to see the screen okay. I'm a little concerned that if you're off axis, you won't get the brightness because some of the scenes are dark. But if you, but if you want to get up and move around after, after things start rolling, please feel free to, to move into some seats where you can uh, see better. So yeah, let's turn off the lights. And, Is the projector uh, still on? Do you have the projector on? Yeah. It's on. Okay. So uh, we're going to start right from the beginning, from long ago, prehistoric times. People have always created images and uh, and used and and uh, will tell stories around them and. Fire, you know, fire, uh, fires in places, but technology has developed over the years. And uh, there is something called persistence of vision that was uh, discovered by actual scientists in the early 1800s. Persistence of vision <clears throat> says that, uh, let's say someone takes a picture of you and you get that blinding flash, right? Well, you don't get that blinding flash just for a fraction of a second. You, that blinding flash still stays in your eyes for maybe a second or two. That's persistence of vision. So when you see an image move uh, quickly, you will still see those images uh, and, and those images will form motion if it's replaced with another image. So hopefully persistence of, uh, persistence of vision makes sense. Now, <clears throat> at the same time, photography was being developed. This is what's called a a camera obscura. So it, so you have the sun projecting uh, scattering rays, and this is a room, imagine this being a completely dark room and a hole in one side of the room. And <clears throat> what would happen is with a, a camera obscura, the, the sunlight would be projected onto the opposite wall. So this hole acts like a, a, a lens. So, <clears throat> Uh, cameras, so the and the image would be projected on the wall upside down. Now artists would use this to trace landscapes uh, outside, and eventually the camera obscura became reduced to a box where people could trace images, and also uh, that box became the basis for a photographic camera. Now photography. <clears throat> uh, uh, uses a film emulsion. Originally, the film was uh, just, uh, they would use metal tin types and glass, and, and the glass or the metal was coated with an emulsion. And, what the, and the emulsion is light sensitive. So little grains or crystals that were in this emulsion would be light sensitive and capture light and create an image. So <clears throat> photography developed very quickly over the course of the 18th century or the 19th century. Hopefully we're playing here. Where am I paused? Okay, here we go. So here's some images uh, from early photography. Now this man was important in creating, helping to create motion pictures, but he didn't know it. He was just, he was a wealthy industrialist, Leland Stanford, if you've ever heard of Stanford University, he's, it's named after him. He hired this man because he wanted. To, he made a bet to win $25,000. He bet that a horse would have all four hooves off the ground at one time. What uh, Mybridge did was he put strings attached to cameras and as the horse ran through, it uh, tripped the camera wire. And he did, in fact, show that a horse would actually have all four legs lifted off the ground at one point in time. So now we have an image, uh, a sequence of images. And you can see that 
Uh, and, and by the way, Mybridge did motion studies for the rest of his life. He devoted himself to this. And uh, animators still use his most animal and human motion studies that were done uh, at that time. So we had moving images, but we, or we had images, but we, had, we didn't know how to make them move. Well, this man, George Eastman, created a flexible film stock, again, with film emotion, emulsion. And this flexible stock was the uh, answer to what people thought would be their uh, a solution. Thomas Edison created the kinescope, kin uh, kinograph and kinescope. Now the kinescope was a motion, the first motion, one of the first motion picture devices. And you can see that this is one of the first Edison films. It was not a projector, it was a viewer, as you saw that person looking through the viewer. And he had these rather, at the time, considered scandalous uh, uh, films. But the Lumiere brothers in France created their own camera, and this camera was also a projector. So you could take the back off the camera, push light through it, and project, project your image. Now, and again, used the flexible film that uh, George Eastman created. Now, the project, no one had ever seen projected moving images in Paris when this was shown. And when this was shown, people literally jumped out of their seats when they saw this train coming at them and ran out. <laughs> and at this point, uh, cinema was really born. So why do we use visual effects? So let's look at this little film that was shot by, um, uh, the uh, Edison Company. Uh, it's terrible that that actor had to die for this film. <laughs> now, let's look at this again and see what happened here. Actually, you may have guessed that the camera stopped and started and there was a cut and when they were on set, they replaced that uh, actor with a dummy or mannequin dressed in the same costume. So that's the basis of visual effects right there. It's a post-production, and you can see this is George Melier. He is the grandfather. He invented practically everything in visual effects. And you'll see what I mean as we go along. You see he's stopping and starting the camera. He's making these chairs uh, appear by stopping and starting the camera. This is another technique. In this black area, he's double exposing. Double exposing means you wind the film back and you expose more light onto the film. This is an amazing piece of footage. Here he is stopping and starting the camera. He's throwing a mannequin head up in the air. He is uh, double exposing uh, these images of himself on this music staff. And uh, he, he does, he's, the other thing about Melier, George Melier was an actor, a director, a producer. He was a technician. He, he, Lumeray would not sell him their camera. And he said, I'm gonna build my own camera projector. And he did. He could do anything, he was a genius. And so you, now I wanna show you this. Notice this shot, this is a forced perspective. This is not a visual effects technique, but these people are entering here, but this is a painting on a, on a studio backing. That forced perspective technique is still used in films all the time today. And you can see that he had an exquisite sense of design. His stuff is very, is very joyful. It's very, it's playful. It's emotional. It's just it, he, he, he was a genius, and he really did create the foundation of all visual effects. You see, he used miniatures and all that. Now his stuff didn't look real; it looked designed. But you can see that uh, this film, <clears throat> The Lost World, uh, which there was a Jurassic Park Lost World uh, as well, you, but this looks more realistic. And uh, the, the creature here is what's called a stop motion creature. Stop motion is you have a, a puppet with uh, an armature, uh, kind, of a, kind of a bone structure, metal bone structure, and you can move, you can set the position of the creature and you can take a picture and then you can uh, go to the next frame, move the creature, take another picture. So, that's what's happening here. This is called stop motion, and it's being blended with live action in a, in a really sophisticated way for the time. This is a very famous film, Metropolis, which was made in Germany, directed by Fritz Lang. You can see that there are miniatures, there is animation. You see the animation of the miniatures. It's an exquisite sense of design. 
and visually it's, am it's just amazing. This is the famous robot transformation sequence that uh, was done for the film. And uh, you can see the use of animation. Uh, you can see the use of <clears throat> superimposing, double exposing, and saying one thing over another. This is King Kong. Um, this was back in America. Uh, this is what's called a matte painting. A matte painting is literally is a painting either on glass or on a backing. So you've got a matte painting, you've got this live action that is, has been uh, put into black areas of the matte painting. You've got the creature, the, again, stop motion. You've got some smoke and mist here that are all put together. That smoke and mist does a lot to help seal the deal, you know, that makes you believe the illusion. So uh, this, this was an incredible feat at the time. And again, people had never seen anything like this and they were frightened, just like many of us were frightened when we saw Jurassic Park. Uh, Wizard of Oz is an amazing, magical film. We, you can see matte paintings here. We'll talk a little more about matte paintings, but again, super, uh, double exposing film and uh, matte paintings, miniatures. But color was, was that was the first film that they had to deal with color and it was, very, it was a very difficult, much more difficult process to have the color. This is Gone with the Wind, which most people don't think of as a visual effects film, but the, this part was shot in California. Actually, it was all shot in California. This area was unexposed and then exposed later with a matte painting. And here's the, again, this is what's called a plate. A plate is the actual live action background that you're gonna put something on. And in the industry, it, got, it became known as a plate early on. But you can see these, and here's a wide shot matte painting of uh, this procession. So uh, this is an interesting shot. This was actually all just built outside of a stage at the MGM lot. <clears throat> and, um, and so you can see these fire elements. This is a matte painting. This, this is actually, back here, is uh, one of the large sets from King Kong. They needed to get rid of the set. It was cheaper to burn it, and, they need, and so they saved money by burning the set. But you can see how uh, these fire elements are being layered on top. Uh, one, one of the things I, and you can see, like this is just a silhouette, right? And there's the big King Kong set coming down. And of course, that was filmed in, in slow motion. Now, this I'm gonna stop for a moment and talk about. Uh, this is, Ten Commandments is famous for blue screen. You see all these people right here? See this line of people? They were shot against blue screen. Now, most people are aware of green screen or blue screen, you probably, you, it's, I don't know, it seems like every time I turn on the television, somebody's in, uh, in against a green screen or a, blue, a green screen today. But this is the film that blue screen was developed for. Later, green screen was used uh, uh, as well as blue screen. But that's, uh, but what, why, what is blue screen? Basically, it's a way of saying there's a color, a pure color on the film that I can, I can take away that color and it will create, we, in visual effects it's called a mat. A mat is just an opening or a, uh, an area that you can surround. <clears throat> so it creates a mat so that you can have the people, you can put in this water. This was, there were tons of water that were used. Now this is upside, shot upside down. There, this, and this is shot upside down. This was shot, this is actually running in reverse. So if you watch this, you'll see that it's going away, it's running. So it was poured, it was coming toward the camera. Here it's running in reverse. Now this, one thing about visual effects, this is just like multi-track recording for me. So you, you know in multi-track, I'm gonna stop the film for the moment. You know in when you make music, or when you do multi-track recording, you record the drums on one uh, track, you record the bass on another track, the lead guitar, the vocal, right? Visual effects is exactly the same thing. You have all of these elements. You have, you know, you've got this element in, but this, actually, basically, there's only, in this shot, there's only two elements, and I'll talk about that. But think of visual effects exactly like multi-track recording, and you're putting things together, and you're making some things louder and some things softer, and some things you want brighter, some things you want darker, but you want a blend so that it all 
sounds like it was recorded at the same time, or it looks like it was all <coughs> made at the same time. Now, this was done by Ray Harryhausen. This is an amazing feat. He's got a dozen skeletons, and he is doing stop motion on all of them at once, and he has to keep in mind how he's going to keep each one of those motion moving, where each one is going, and at, you know, straight ahead. I had the opportunity to meet uh, Mr. Harry Housen, and I asked him about this shot, that particular shot. He said it, he had he, he was up for like 48 hours or two, two and a half days, and the main thing he was concerned about was if one of the bulbs blew out while he was filming his shot because it would have ruined and he would have to start over. And um, so his work is revered by animators, and animators still study his work to today. 2001 A Space Odyssey is an incredible visual effects feat. Now, it, uh, this, these shots were not shot outdoors. This is what's called front projection, and, but is it a, it is, they're projecting that footage in a set, and no one had ever made anything look so real. This is the first use of what's called motion control, and I'm gonna have to stop the projector for a moment and, talk, and tell you what motion control is. Imagine you have a computer. You know, and, and you've got a computer and it's hooked up to a camera and that camera, or it's hooked up to a track and that track on it has a camera that can roll back and forth like a dolly and it also can swing the camera this way or that way or you can, you'll see later there's, there you can have a track with a boom arm and the boom arm can move on the camera. But the computer controls all of the camera movements. Now why is that important? Because you can repeat a camera movement exactly, you can, you can shoot another element that has exactly the same motion, right? Uh, in this case, uh, this was, you, you've got here, they're moving the miniature down, they're burning in these, these little things in the, uh, in the side of the wall, but that's what motion control is, and they're building up all of these elements and putting them together. Okay, this is the famous Stargate sequence from uh, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. This is a kind of early form of computer-generated imagery. This was done by Douglas Trumbull, and uh, I'll talk a little more about uh, where this came from, but it is, it's not it's not fully computer generated, uh, but it, 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 it relies on a camera. Star Wars. Star Wars was the film that used motion control again, and it also, Star Wars really told a story with a lot of, um, uh, it really supported the, the script and, and created uh, you know, an emotional, uh, a lot of different emotions. Now here you see this character, this little miniature character, Leia, of course, but what's happening here? This is exactly like those Melies shots we saw earlier, right? This, the, just burning, he's double exposing in uh, this genie out of the bottle, right? Uh, all of these visual, all of these um, animated lasers, animated light swords, these were all done by, <coughs> supervised by Adam Beckett, and uh, this is a very simple thing. It's really, again, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's multiple exposures, it's double exposures, and you have these swords that have, have glows on them, uh, blue and red, and sparks that come out. But again, it's, it, it goes back to using these techniques. What makes Star Wars special was the, that the art, uh, that lasers look like laser, but more like what you think a laser should look like. Look like. And the, the quality of the image was art directed in a way that was, was uh, really special for the time. The motion control here is different than the motion control that you saw. See the blurring of the background? This emphasizes speed. Star Wars emphasized speed and action. Whereas 2001 was very slow moving bodies in space. This was like a, a World War II dogfight in, in space, all right? So, um, this, uh, and, and you see those really cool curves 
groups that they're able to, to get out. And, and, and they use uh, pyrotechnics as well, blended in with, uh, and this was done by Joe Skosel, who's a pyrotechnician, but you can see the kind of detail that was put into Star Wars. Now, this is John Dykstra, and this is a motion control camera. This is the Dykstraflex, and actually the Dykstraflex is now on, is now being shown in Los Angeles <laughs> uh, at, at uh, the Motion Picture uh, Academy. It's been brought out of, out of the dust bin. You'll see that this has been rigged to, for, for breaking. They'll add an explosion later. Some miniatures will get an explosion added later, and some will get put in on the set. So depending on what makes sense uh, you know, for the shot and for how, and how much they have to rebuild the miniature. This will show, this is like a beauty pass. So, so this is using a motion control to get, there's the lights and uh, the engines. Here they're uh, turning on the lights in the background to get a silhouette of the ship. Now you can use a blue screen or a green screen for that. So how did they put all of the, how have all these images been put together? Well, this is what's called an optical printer. And for years, um, optical printers were used before there were digit, before there was digital technology. This is the primary way that images were put together. Just like you have Photoshop to put images together today. Um, if you can imagine a, a, a projector and a camera, and the camera is focused directly on the film gate, and as the film moves forward in the camera, it rephotographs what's in that projector gate. In this case, there's two projectors, and you can get basically two elements. You might be able to get the background of the Death Star and just the beauty pass of the ship, and then you rewind the camera and do another exposure where you would get the lights of the ship. So that's what an optical printer did. And these are now completely obsolete because of, of, of digital technology. And um, there are a few people who sh still shoot things on film. Once in a while, uh, uh, motion pictures are shot on film. But uh, you can see that this camera and is looking at the stuff in the gate. And this is Robbie Blaylock, who was the optical supervisor on the first Star Wars, uh, talking about what we just talked about, the fact that you, you can put these things together. Okay, computer graphics. Let me stop a moment. Uh, John Whitney. John Whitney, is this, going, is, this, is this all going too fast, or is it going about the right pace, or it's okay? All right. John Whitney, uh, uh, created a form of computer graphics that relied on a motion picture camera and uh, artwork and an analog computer. We don't think about analog computers today, but in World War II they had analog computers and they would they would they would use to they would use them to probably position things like uh, guns and the angle of guns and turrets and things like that. John Whitney hooked up uh, I mean, uh, after uh, he found one of these and hooked it up. And you can see that he's hooked up this to this artwork and he's rephotographing it and he made images like this. Now, what you saw earlier from 2001, the Stargate sequence, what, and he did uh, this title sequence for Hitchcock, but, but let's get back to 2001 for just a moment. What uh, the visual effects supervisor, Douglas Trumbull, did, he knew uh, John Whitney. He, he was one of those, it's funny, but you find out that in California, certain people ended up knowing each other. Like, uh, there was a group of people who worked, who were kids who were down the street from Ray Harryhausen, and they became stop motion animators. Uh, several people knew John Whitney, uh, Robert Abel and uh, uh, others, but, uh, Doug Trumbull did 2001 using his, one of his computers in that technique, but the difference was when the shutter was open, he moved the camera forward, and that created this light effect that was streaked in space in three dimensions. So, I, and you'll see that if you have, you've seen, we've all seen photos of like a city at night and, and uh, the shutter's left open and you get these streaks of lights on cars. 
This is Ivan Sutherland. He created a, he didn't create vector graphics, but he created a way to interact with vector graphics. So this is one of the early forms of computers. So now what are vector graphics? Vector graphics are just really, just lines. If you ever heard of uh, Adobe Illustrator, that is vector graphics. They're lines that, that are um, connected and, but, for the most part, uh, they don't have to be in three-dimensional space. They can just exist in two-dimensional space. The difference here is instead of having to rely on a film camera that would create images, this is there is a there is a, a virtual camera in this world. Okay, and and there he's he developed a way to interact with a computer to do vector graphics. Now, the guys that, this is, a, this is a film that was made around 1975. When I first moved to California, I, I happened to see this film and I, I, it was, so you can see it's vector graphics. It doesn't look real, but it's a very interesting early an computer animation. No one had ever seen anything like it. So now I'm gonna stop and talk about the kind of computer graphics you're probably are familiar with today, and that is vector graphics. I'm sorry, that is raster graphics. So you've seen vector graphics or lines. The difference between vector graphics and raster graphics is in raster graphics, you have images that are created by rows of what are called pixels, picture elements. Picture elements, uh, uh, the, the, the term pixels really mean picture elements. So instead of having crystals on a film emulsion that were light sensitive, you basically have um, rows of pixels that, uh, that determine the color of your image. So with early computer graphics, they said, well, you know, we've got these, this geometry. Geometry means the, these, the, this wireframe. And maybe we can put a surface on this and light the surface to, uh, and then they said, well, let's let's smooth, we'll do, do a, someone came up with the idea of smooth shading this, and so then you add light to this and you get these specular highlights, and things begin to look more real. Now, this is what's called a texture map. A texture map is any picture, any digital image, like you can take a texture map of an actor, right, and you can put it on a teapot or you can take the texture map of an actor and put it on a character, on a digital model of a character. So that's what texture mapping means. And this is a texture map of brick, in a, and, and, it's, uh, and here you see the lighting. There is reflections of, of teapots within <coughs> this. So uh, there's very subtle red bouncing off the walls here, blue on that side. So, that is the basis of the compute raster graphics that we use today. Now this is an early animation that was done at Robert Abel and Associates. They didn't know how to animate computer graphics like this, and so they actually shot uh, a, a model on the set, as you see, and they copied her motions in order to create this. And um, this, was, this was one of those things that was very important in the scheme of things. So this is Tron, this is a film that I worked on. You can see here that the actors were shot with these black and white costumes. And these were turned into these large format, they're called codeliths, so they're big, big images of, and they're negative and positive. And here, the different areas are blocked out so that you can just color, say, the body color, the circuit color, the face, and then you can composite all these together. These were not composited on a uh, optical printer, but they were composited on an animation down shooter. I can talk more about that later if you have questions about it. <clears throat> and then uh, these things were integrated with, com with computer graphics uh, here, like so. So uh, one of the, the next big uh, computer graphics feature film was this, this was done by Pixar. Pixar, a lot of people don't know, but Pixar originally was an industrial light and magic doing visual effects for George Lucas. George Lucas sold uh, Pixar to Steve Jobs. But this was one of, this was the first character animation. Uh, 
certainly that I can think of that that it, it was it was a stained glass man. So to see this stained glass image come to life was very um, uh, groundbreaking at the time. This is the abyss. Now the abyss. Uh, the real the real uh, part of the abyss that's important is the computer graphics. I'll get to that in a moment. But the abyss had this great uh, motion control uh, submarines that looked like they were underwater. It, it was very realistic and looked like they were underwater. They developed the smallest 35 millimeter projector ever to go inside one of the miniatures so they could project uh, the actors inside the submarine. And in a moment, you'll see that. So here's the shot of her inside the submarine. Here's one, here's one of the passes with the ship, and then here's just the pass of the projected image and inside the ship. And of course, there were blue screen elements that were shot for uh, the abyss and composite together. But now we get to the big uh, change that happened, and that is the water creature that was done for the abyss. This is the, you saw the, the, the uh, earlier character, it was just, you know, like a, a flat metal character. But this is the first time we saw a human face uh, with real detail, so you could make it a recognizable uh, human. Oh. And it was uh, quite stunning at the time to see uh, this happen. And you'll notice that water looks a bit like chrome. It's transparent, but there's a lot of reflections like chrome. Well, for Terminator 2, uh, Industrial Light and Magic did kind of expanded upon what they learned from the abyss and created this chrome man. And again, you can texture map things on, right? So they texture mapped the face of the actor onto the CG. So you can see how these things build on one another and develop. Now this is an amazing uh, sequence from Jurassic Park. Uh, and of course Jurassic Park was groundbreaking for the character creature animation. It, they, at the time they looked about as real as you could imagine computer graphics looking. So you see the red here that the animator uses to control the geometry, the wireframe. Here it's a little further along. This is also, of course, compute, the, the chief is computer graphics. There's rain on the set, so they have to create CG rain that's gonna go on here. There's shadows as well that get created that will get composited in to the scene. Here's the kids shot against blue screen, and these kids are gonna go into the Jeep and they're gonna get tracked with the Jeep and uh, when I saw, I mean, I knew this was all CG, I knew it was all visual effects, but I remember just feeling, I couldn't help but feel terrified for seeing these little kids in this Jeep at the time. This is just an example of how people rough things out, you know? You start simple and you keep adding uh, more, more information. Now this is the plate, right? The background that was shot without anything and here, there, see the grid lines that the artists are putting in? And then they're putting in uh, a grid for the creatures to run on. So, they, so you can see the process of how they approach these. And again, this is the other thing that's just amazing. This is Steven Spielberg here, and he's biting his knuckles while he's filming this. Now, there's no dinosaurs there, but he's imagining them in his head, right? So, and, Here's, here's the first, like a first real simple dinosaur that the animators are working on. You see they've got that uh, structure of the uh, stainless steel uh, tank, or, or not tank, but uh, kitchen uh, uh, counter uh, area. And you see that the animation becomes, uh, both the model and the animation gets refined. At, and it takes you know, many, many iterations. And uh, here you see there's two characters, there's shadows, there's reflections here on the stainless steel. And all that really, you know, it sells the shot, it seals it, it feels real. Twister is known for particle effects. What are particle effects? Imagine little imaginary points in space. 
and you can attach a little one bit of sand to it, and you can um, and you can tell it, I've got imaginary wind, and I can blow this wind around, and if there's fence posts or pieces of a barn or a roof or whatever, I can attach each piece to a particle and do and apply these physical wind effects to it. So uh, this is Titanic. I worked on Titanic in the shot, and I just in only included it because so many people know it, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to have worked on Titanic. Uh, and the, the boat, uh, first of all, all the stuff in the boat was really great. Everything in Titanic is great, but what really is groundbreaking to me and what's really important are all these little people on the boat. Because when I was watching this, I knew that these were CG people when, when I saw the final film, but I still felt something when you see these CG people hitting parts of the ship and sliding down, and uh, it looked real. Uh, and I, you, you know, it's, it was, to me, this is, everything else was uh, certainly great refinement, but those CG people, uh, those, those what, what are called, they call them crowds, CG crowds. Uh, but the, the dynamics and the uh, animation that was applied to them, that feeling of weight and the feeling of, of, of hitting, interacting with other objects was completely believable. Uh, and of course the water was uh, also uh, CG and was also uh, you know, better than any other water I'd say. The matrix, this is called the bullet time effect. The bullet time effect is, you can imagine, it's the camera is slowing down and it's moving around the actor. So, uh, how is this done? Well, do you remember that sh those, yeah. the, do you remember those shots with the camp of the horse with the camera mm -hmm. in sequence? We have exactly the same thing here, except now these are a bunch of still cameras, not motion picture cameras, still cameras in a certain, instead of a straight line pointing toward a horse, in a circle pointing toward the actors. And you can see that they're, they're being, and they're being triggered not by a wire, but they're being triggered by a computer so that they can trigger these to go really quick and make fast action or trigger them slow uh, I'm sorry, trigger them really quick to slow things down or trigger them slow to speed things up. This is a virtual environment, so you'll see that this, this environment gets texture mapped, as we talked about, and gets lit, and so you have a virtual background, and then we take the green screen, and, and of course you can get rid of the green, and you put the characters into that virtual environment, and again, that motion control uh, 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 well, not in this case, not motion control, but the, com the, the, com uh, the computer can be used not only to uh, shoot the, uh, to trigger the cameras, but also to design the shot and say, okay, uh, where do we need to place the cameras? How fast do we want to trigger the cameras? And so forth. That you can, so you can pre-visualize that on the computer. Lord of the Rings is important for the motion capture. So what's motion capture? Motion capture is, this guy's in a, you can't see him here, but he's in a suit, and these suit, the suits have sensors. So if you move your arm, there are other sensors in, a, in the studio where this is filmed that pick up those motions, and it translates all those motions into points in space, in three-dimensional space, and then it can apply them to the, the CG character. Uh, so, the actor, uh, his name is Andy Serkis, that his, all of his actions, his facial expressions were captured, and this is some early uh, CG, but the eyes are really important. The eyes in this are the best, and the skin treatment, it, it looks so great, uh, but you'll see in CG, lots of times people can't get the eyes right. They really got it right with Dolly. Uh, Avatar is famous for, to me, the most important thing in Avatar is, are the landscapes. There are billions of trees, uh, leaves, bushes, uh, ferns, plants, 
water, rocks, every it, the, and, the, and no one, I knew for years it was going to take a long time to be able to create, uh, to solve the problem of creating believable landscapes. Now this isn't, uh, of course, this is not uh, realistic, but it's a beautiful kind of magical, wondrous design that was done. The other thing that's important is the same, Web Digital did this. They did Gollum, and they also did these. And so they, from Gollum, they learned how to create, uh, you know, they had success in creating these characters and, and getting the, what's called translucency. Translucency is uh, light that scatters on, on skin and other objects. But you can see that the interaction between the, the live action and the characters and the, these characters is really great. Amazing, ama again, this is motion captured, but the amazing thing here is how ILM is able to uh, create these characters uh, and uh, make you believe that they're, they're just there, they're real. And, uh, the interaction between all of the uh, the live action and the characters is is amazing. So this brings us to where we are today: um, virtual film production. Virtual film production is the idea that you have a virtual set, you have a virtual camera, you can you can lay out, you know, you can say, oh, I've, I've got a in real life, I'm going to have a uh, an 18 foot Technicolor dolly track. I'm going to have a certain kind of light and I'm going to be shooting something. I think this was actually done for The Martian. Oh, yeah, it says there The Martian. Uh, but uh, so, and again, so, so you can uh, pre vis, pre visualize, uh, and this came out of pre visualization which again is just pre-production, you're deciding what goes in, but in this case, you have a, a virtual, you know, you've got the CG environment that's only exists, but you can move around in that CG environment with this camera, and you can um, create images that you will either just use, you will enhance as computer graphics, or you will say, okay, I can't get this as a computer graphic, I'm gonna go out and shoot it, but this is gonna tell me exactly how I need to shoot it for it to fit in here, because it has all been worked out in advance. So that's what, uh, this is what is happening now and, and is the future. So you can imagine, You've got some scene that takes place here. Maybe I, uh, this is probably from a war game, and these are. But if you were going to to shoot a war sequence, you might uh, use you know pre pre visualize that, and if you needed an actor in there, a re the real star of the show in there, you figure out a way to put him in, in that. Now this is an image. This is another uh, way of using. Uh, High resolution uh, imagery that's being computer generated. The what's going on here is there's a rig here that's moving this around, and there's a camera and actors inside. For a long time, we've shot actors against blue screens, green screens, or rear projection. Uh, rear projection isn't so great because it can't necessarily. If you've shot something already and it's locked, you're locked into what that rear projection is. Here, with a virtual, uh, uh, very high resolution uh, projection, which uh, hasn't existed until recently, uh, you can have. I think this is probably for a cockpit of, uh, of a shot. You can have, you can film your actor in. It could be in a car. You can move the car around and. Green screens don't pick up, you don't pick up the lighting in the environment that's actually there when you have a projector like this. So that's the advantage to this. So this really takes us up to today and where, where visual effects have come from and where they are now and where they're going. So that's the, that's the video. So, um,
Who has questions? <laughs> you to pause it when I was when you kept talking about um, overlaying yeah you know and then you answered the question with those couple of projectors yeah but in the days of when they were beheading Queen Mary of Scots what did they do then like did they have something similar um not originally the remember the optical printer I showed you the camera projector that that re records yeah. images that the optical printer was uh, developed in the 1920s, I think it was 1927 was the first time someone cre uh, came up with the idea of, of creating that camera projector situation. Um, there were lots of ways people tried to and, and did produce uh, uh, composites, but um, there, yeah, there, there, it wasn't that way originally. I mean, and, were they actually splicing film? Mm -hmm. Before and after, and sticking well, it together. Um, sure. Scott time. Oh, that that yeah. particular one. Yeah. yeah, you just that's the whole thing. You just stop the camera. Uh -huh. You 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 repeat your action. Like right? so, the actors the actor has got this act and he's doing yeah. this, and he goes back and they swap out the actor. They they put in the dummy and and he repeats his action again, and this time he chops the head of the dummy off. And then, and then in the edit, you just take those two pieces of film and you cut them, splice them together. That's, that's all that was done there. But that is a visual effect because it is a post-production process mm -hmm. that creates an illusion. It changes time. Not all changes of time are, but in this case, it, it technically is a visual effect. Yes. What was your um, focus in the industry? Uh, I did a lot of different things, too many different things. That's a good question. Um, one of the things about the industry is it has become more and more specialized, and that's necessary for because you have so many different uh, specialized requirements. Um, but I started out. Uh, I start. I, I went. I, I started out as uh, my first job was with a company called Robert Abel and Associates, the one that did the the uh, <clears throat> the actor who for the uh, the ro the sec what was called sexy robot that early computer graphics, and I worked on the first Star Trek film, and we used uh, I I got introduced to motion control and computer graphics. There they had the first. Uh, vector graphics machine in Hollywood. And so I, uh, I, we were using that on uh, on Star Trek. Uh, from there, I, uh, I ended up learning about what's called um, uh, edit, uh, visual effects editing, which was getting elements together to go to. Uh, you, you'd have to say, okay, somebody would shoot all this stuff and an editor would have to take it and say, uh, okay, I've got this and this and this, and and uh, this all has to be organized and presented to the people who are going to do the optical printing. And so from that process, I started getting involved with optical printing and figuring out how to put things together and learning more about how things worked at the time. Um, and um, so eventually, uh, I, I, I was one of those people who wasn't necessarily the best specialist at anything, but I was real good at, see, at looking at other people's talents and saying, you know what, you're really good at doing this, and you're really good at doing that, and you're really do, good at doing this. I want to get you guys together and do this. So I became more of a person who would um, supervise things and uh, get things together and kind of supervise a crew. Uh, I, I liked working in, on, in situations where we would, uh, where there was a, a kind of a startup company or a startup crew where we would put stuff together. That changed because after Star Wars, um, the, the industry started gravitating more and more towards larger and larger facilities 
and more people working in those facilities and more and more specialization. I, for, I, when I went to industrial, so when I went to industrial like man, uh, in magic, I was supervising seven departments or managing seven departments. And uh, it really wasn't fun because it turned into, okay, I've got to write your review and I've got to make sure that, you know, <laughs> you know, you know <laughs> yeah, and uh, I'll tell you a funny story. There were, okay, so one of the units that I managed was called the Rebel Unit, and the Rebel Unit had all of these young guys and they, were, they weren't using the same computer, they were using Apple computers and they were using uh, 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 a, a certain piece of, uh, uh, a certain application on the Apple computer that wasn't being used by the rest of the facility, and they were doing things their way, and they, you know, they they were they were they were the rebel unit. So uh, so one one day uh, there was one of these guys. Uh, I see that one of these guys puts his name on the side of the ship that's in, in Star Wars. It's mm -hmm. J Bart. And this kid's name was Jonathan Rothbart. And so there's J. Bart written on the side of the ship. And I'm like, man, you know, okay, great. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't even want to know I saw this, right? <laughs> and so the ship is, you know, going through space. And I'm going, okay, nobody's ever going to see it. I don't, you know, I don't care. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get into an art, you know, a deal. I'm not going to be the bad guy with this guy. Well, what happened was, the next thing you know, they take this ship and Rebel does a model for it while we're in production and puts this ship on the on the box. And so someone at the at, at Lucas Ranch, you know, a, a marketing person, sees the ship on the box and says J Bar and flips out and calls oh, no. and calls ILM and, and calls Fumer and gets me. And then I got to deal with the fact that. <laughs> This kid put his name on the side of the ship, and said, so, "And then I'm trying. I'm hoping no one, you know, you know I, I'm, but anyway, then someone said, well, someone said you saw it on there.' And I'm like, oh man. So anyway, it was stuff like that. So um, you know, it, I really liked working at Industrial Light and Magic, uh, and I I love the artistry, and I love being able to put crews together and do stuff. I I produce the visual effects." And producing visual effects is hard because then you got to just worry about the money. Um, so there, yeah, I did a lot of different things, and um, eventually I, I decided to stop. Uh, I taught um, for a year and a half, uh, but then I went back into the industry. I worked at Disney. I worked um, as a uh, technical, what's called a technical director. So. You can imagine there are artists who do things and there are technical people who help, basically help artists do things. So I became a technical director. I didn't manage anyone and uh, basically worked doing that in computer graphics. And uh, then I went to DreamWorks. Uh, I had a friend there, she said, will you come and train people on our pipeline? Pipeline is, uh, every studio has their own way of doing things and it's very, you can guess it's very complicated and each studio also has their own, you know, secret sauce, so to speak. So I went to Dream, DreamWorks and I taught, um, I taught basically everybody who came in who got hired at DreamWorks for six years, the DreamWorks pipeline. And especially the, what's called lighting and surfacing. Surfacing was the texture mapping. So you have, you know, you have animated characters who have you know, you've got to put, you know, just the right stuff on their on their face. And but everything is texture map. So, but anyway, lighting and surfacing. So, and uh, so, and then I ended up after after DreamWorks, I ended up doing what's called I I I, I become a, I became a pipeline. Um, uh, I specialize in doing pipeline work, which is programming basically and automating processes so so. That, Everybody, artists, producers, and every, everyone could do things fast. And uh, I really enjoyed that because I had this broad background. I worked in, as a producer, I worked 
you know, as an artist, I worked, I supervised, I worked in editorial, I knew the process of, the, I had a big, uh, the big view of the process, and that, that was, it was fun, I always liked things like databases and, and uh, putting in con how, how we could automate these processes, so that's my history uh, in more than a nutshell. <laughs> Speaking of history, I'm a big fan of Fritz Lang's early movies. Oh, like Metrop Metropolis. Certainly. I came in late. Did you show any seg segments? I time? actually did show Metropolis. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. You did. Yes, sir. Yes, and I li likewise, I'm a big fan of Fritz Lang and uh, okay. him and um, uh, oh gee, I'm trying to trying to think of the other one that's my favorite that I'm blanking out right now. Yes. How many other schools are teaching this? You know, who wanted to go into it? What, what when I started, it? no one was teaching this except for California Institute of the Arts, where I went. They had a they had a, a film graphics uh, program uh, and a uh, they had an experimental animation program, and uh, now there it's being taught uh, in. in practically everywhere, but the level of education varies greatly. You had a question? No, I was just curious. Well, I remember James Cameron saying he had to wait for the technology to catch up uh -huh. to Avatar before he made it. Yeah. What did he mean by that? What he meant was special he was- Special effects, visual, everything, or- he... Visual effects. Visual effects. Yeah, yeah. What he meant was, um, you know, if you looked at computer graphics prior to uh, Lord, Lord of the Rings, the, you, every, when you see a computer graphic character, you just go, well, there's something that's called the Uncanny Valley, all right? The Uncanny Valley is you see something and you go, that's just not quite right. And computer graphic characters uh, uh, can look not quite right. And right. Gollum looked great. Gollum looked like, wow, that's, yeah, I mean, it wasn't a human was being. Because the human being or the human element was involved with right. the computer. Right, so he was waiting, and when he saw what Weta did with Gollum, he was ready to then do. he was ready to do his yeah. thing. Now, he had, been in, he had been developing Avatar for quite some time. Yeah, I understand that. I yeah, think. but he wasn't, he wasn't gonna do it until he saw that, that he could, he could get those creatures uh, looking right. Yeah. yeah. So right. Any other questions? No. Yes. Um, I'm the older generation, perhaps. But, uh, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I'll go to a movie and I'll go, I think they've overdone it a little bit. Um, you know, and it's wonderful. I mean, it's incredible what they can do. But sometimes I go, but that's not very realistic. You know, because it's so far up. Yeah. Is that a concern of yours at all? I couldn't agree more. I I see visual effects today, and they're I mean they're they are they're they are absolutely amazing. But I see shot after shot where I go, you know, this is too much. It's just like I know, uh, you know, I know this is CG, and I don't care anymore because it's just it. It's it is overdone. So like and overkill. It's overkill. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't anything the imagination, basically. Well, it's it's it, I don't I don't mean from that point of view. I could show you footage where I mean I, I see all the time things like you have a person making a transition from one world or they're going into this other imaginary world, and in that imaginary world we go through some kind of machines or something, and those machines are like turning and twisting and turning themselves inside out and all this stuff and you go you know what's this you know it does this it doesn't really support it doesn't mean anything to at a certain point because they're just trying they're i mean at a certain point you you i think visual effects people they're trying to to pop a visual and they're trying to do it in a way that's not um not, not effective really to that supports the story you know what that's like? <laughs> Somebody learning PowerPoint and doing one of their first presentations and they're taking all of the different tools. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, if they're people, coming in from this way and that way, it's like they yeah, have to keep up. I mean, quite often people overdo things <laughs> and, and for different reasons, but I, I do feel that in visual therapists right um, now. One more question. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I don't. No, one more question. In your trauma sequence, mm -hmm. you couldn't help but notice, I don't know what the vehicle is called, but it's the one that's floating on the line. It's like right. That's that called, one? that's called, the, that, the name of that is the Solar Sailor. Solar Sailor, so they did keep it in with the, because in the game, that has also Tron and Solar Sailor in it. I didn't know if they kept it the same name, which is cool. No, we couldn't help but notice the hidden Mickey when they were looking over in the... Oh, yeah. And so all yeah. those little <laughs> Easter eggs that I think probably yeah. uh, Pixar was most famous for them, but I, we couldn't help but notice that. She goes, now look for the hidden Mickey. I go, oh, yeah, I see it. Yeah. And it's very subtle, and unless you're looking for it, you would miss it. Yeah. But things like that, when you're a visual person, do you just relish in those and enjoy them? Or what? <laughs> or do they drive you nuts? No, they don't drive me nuts. I mean, I remember you the guy. Have fun with them? I remember the guy who put that in. And uh, yeah. Chris. Uh, we thought it was amazing. So. Chris Cassidy. Yeah, Chris Cassidy. We were working on Tron, and he put that in. And, you know, all the supervisors looked at it and went, okay. And he also put in, there's one shot with the evil guy, and he also put in a Pac-Man behind it, behind the evil yeah. character. Chris Cassidy did that. And it was like, I remember, you know, I mean, it's like, yeah, I mean, you know, if people find it and they think it's fun, I think that's great. Yeah, we think it's great. Yeah, so, so uh, anyway. Oh, one other thing I'm going to tell you. Uh, 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 people sometimes wonder about Hey, why does Star? Why are these black lines? Why? Why does these old? Why do these old films have black lines around people and fire and stuff like that? Those are called nat lines. The reason they're there is because the old technology just could not. It, it just wasn't uh, perfect enough to to do. It. So let, let me give you an example. You shoot something in motion control. Well, some you know the temperature rises or drops, and so the motion control, the metal in the motion control camera you know, expands or contracts a little bit. You take that element and you process you process it. And the temperature of the processing of the film changes a little bit. And then you put it in the, op and then the optical printer person puts it together and, uh, you know, maybe something they can't get it, you know, or they don't know it, but it's not just perfectly aligned, you know, or, or, it's, or the, when they, in making the map, they slightly overexposed it so it, it's gotten bigger and blacker. So those are the kinds of things that were, just drove people absolutely crazy before you had digital technology. And when digital technology came, I was so thankful because once, I mean, you can make a map and it's perfect, you know, once you have digital. So, but sometimes people do ask about that. So there's, that's that, those are map lines. and. They're all over Star Wars, and they're part of, part of the history. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will be showing Tron, the original Tron, here tomorrow at 1 o'clock for anyone who's interested in watching it. <laughs> We're all at school. It's the one that he worked on. Look, look for Patman. And, <laughs> and if anybody wants to, you know, I'll be around if anybody has any other questions or wants to find out stuff for whatever.